Am I audible? Mike, uh, the connect connect the space in the system uh, Okay. Shall we get started? Mother, can you speak? Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, is my screen visible? Uh, no, no, not yet. No. No, sir. It's just showing uh, class 11 learning room has started screen sharing. Now also it's not visible. No, sir. Okay. 
Is it visible now? No, sir. No? No, sir. Now at least? Yeah, yeah, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. So then where did we discuss? Uh, we'll discuss the issue of some problems. Uh, the functions, uh, slope, slope of a tangent and uh, the average point, like slope. Okay. Yeah, tell me. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can try out some problems today. Right? On the presentation. Maybe I'll give you two, three problems. Then we can go on to the next one of integration. Okay. So listen. Y is equal to x power 5 sin x. Okay. This first question. Second, y is equal to x square divided by cos x. Third, y is equal to tan x. Right. Then fourth is y is equal to Two x cube into tan x. Y is equal to cosecant x and y is equal to secant x. Yeah. Which one? Can you give me a Excuse me, sir. Yeah, tell me. Uh, sir, y is equal to x power 5 sin x. So, first we need to differentiate for uh, x power 5, then we need to differentiate for sin x. No, that is not how you do. They both are two functions which are multiplied, no? So, we need to uh, differentiate them. Uh, Separately and multiply them? No, no, no. Go and check the product. Tan x will directly hold Tan x to see can directly hold the value. Tan x to see can
completed sir completed sir got the answer yes sir sir uh, i'm just doubtful about the first one rest all i uh, first one and second one rest all i completed okay rest all uh, for the third fifth and sixth right did you directly write the formula or you know you derived it i directly uh, wrote the formula no that's why i didn't give you for the three sir So listen, for the first one, for the first one, y is equal to x power pi sin x no. So dy by dx will be equal to not right. So it is x power pi sin x no. First function into derivative of second function that is cos x plus second function into derivative of first function, which is going to be 5x power 4. Right. So, this is the answer. The answer is supposed to be, you can write it like this also. x power 4, I will take it common. I will write x power 6 plus 5 sin. This is another way of writing. Okay, this is one way. Second y is equal to x square divided by cos x. So, dy by dx will be denominator cos x into derivative of x square that is 2x minus x square into derivative of cos x which is minus sin x the whole divided by cos square x. Right. I hope it's clear. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, sir. I for forgot we need to use product rule and quotient rule. That's what I told you. So, y is equal to tan x is there, no? So, y will be equal to, can I write it as sin x divided by cos x? Yes, sir. So, dy by dx will be equal to cos x into derivative of sin x is cos x minus sin x into derivative of cos x is minus sin x, the whole divided by cos square. This is minus of minus is the whole divided by answer will be 1 divided by cos square x, answer will be Thank you.
Right. Have you understood why you got that value? Yes, sir. We need to uh, take tan x as sin x by cos x. Then we need to uh, use quotient rule uh, to find the answer. Okay. So this is the quotient. Right. What about the next question? So the next one is y is equal to two x cube into tan x. Now you can use since you know the formula here you can use sec square x. So dy by dx is equal to two is a constant. I'll not disturb it. X cube into derivative of tan x is sec square x plus tan x into derivative of uh, x cube is 3x square. So answer is going to be, if I take the x square outside, 2x square into x secant square x plus 3 tan x. That's fine. Not saying you there's no need to write. Without bracket you write also this type. Okay. So the first one. What is the first one? So y is equal to cosecant x, right? See cosecant x you can write it as one divided by sin x. So dy by dx will be equal to sin x into derivative of one, which is indeed because it's a constant minus one into derivative of sin x is going to be cos x, the whole divided by sin square x. This value is zero. So it is going to be minus cos x divided by sin square x, which I write it as sin x into 1 divided by sin x. So cos x by sin x is minus cot x. 1 by sin x is cosecant x. So you have learned this as minus cosecant x cot x. Is the reason why you Here. Yes. So next one. Okay. So sixth one is y is equal to secant x. So y is equal to, can I write it as 1 divided by cos x? So dy by dx will be cos x into derivative of 1 is 0. Minus 1 into derivative of cos x is minus sin x, the whole divided by cos square x. So this value is going to be a 0. Minus of minus is plus. So I'll get sin x divided by cos square x. So you can write as sin x by cos x into 1 by cos x. So sin x divided by cos x into 1 divided by cos x. So 1 by cos x is secant x. Sin x by cos x is tan x. So secant x into tan x is what we're going to be asked. Are clear with this? Right. So now you know how to differentiate the values. Right. Or differentiate the given functions. Now we go to the next concept that is integration. So integration is also the reverse process of differentiation, right? So, for example, if I have dy by dx is equal to x square, meaning, let's say I have y is equal to x cube by 3. At the function b, y is equal to x cube by 3. Differentiate this function and see what we get. dy by dx is equal to x square because you get 3x square by 3, 3 and 3 will get x square. Right? Now the question is when you call this as an equation, right? It is an algebraic equation. Or yeah. This is called as differential equation. So what is it called as? It's called as differential equation because equal to simple is used and you have a derivative. So, if I need, if I if they give you the equation as to the differential equation, you will differentiate. If they give you the differential equation as to the function into 
integrated. So to integrate, what you do is this dy by dx is there, no? which is x squared. This dy is also a variable, dx is also a variable. You will take the dx to the other side, right? Then you will write dy is equal to x squared times dx. And this kind of a process is called as variables separable method because you separated the variables. You separated y on one side, x on other side. Okay. So if I need to eliminate this d right, then I need to use an operation like this, which looks in the form of an elongated S. If you take S and pull it now, you get a symbol, and that symbol is written as integral of dy is equal to integral of x square dx. And it gives this, right? So integral of dy is equal to integral of x square dx. So basically, this is operation of integration. I'm not going to tell you what is the answer as well. This is a process, right? You understood where, where this differentiation comes from? Basically, you will have a function. From that function, if you need the derivative, differentiate. If they give you the derivative and ask you the function, do the reverse process, which is integration. So integrate. Right. So before you integrate, you follow this method. What is this called as? It's called as variable separable method, meaning you separate the variables on either of the sets. Am I clear with this? Right. So based on this kind of an operation, there are certain formulae that we need to know. So here I will take the integral. And here I get the function. Okay. So integral of x power n. If somebody gives you a question like this, it is meaningless. So you need integral of x power n with respect to which variable. So it is dx. So integral of x power n dx is going to be equal to x power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. Right. So there is a point to be noted. And another important point to be noted is whenever you have this integral without limits, so integral without limits is said to be indefinite integration. Integral with limits is called as Definite integration. So when you write the limits, right, you put a here, b here, or any other variable where this a is called as the you call it as the lower limit, and you call this b as the you call it as the upper limit. So it is going to be x power n plus one divided by n plus one. So whenever you do indefinite integration, you need to add a constant. Okay. The reason why we do that is because this is there. No? So this is the function. If I have to get back this question, then what I need to do? See, if this is given on integrating x power n, I got x power n plus 2. So it is like this. On integrating x power n, on integration of x power n, I got x power n plus 1 by n plus 1. So from x power n plus 1 by n plus 1, if I need to get xn, I need to follow the reverse process, which is called as differentiation. Right. So if I different if I ask you to differentiate, what will you tell me? D by dx of x power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. E. So this is one function, this is another function, right? So what will I get? Derivative of x power n plus 1 by n plus 1 is going to be n plus 1 into x power n, the whole divided by n plus 1, because n plus 1 is a constant. 
So what should I integrate or what should I differentiate? Only x power n plus 1. So derivative of x power n plus 1 is n plus 1 into x power reduce the power by 1. x power n, the whole divided by this n plus 1. n plus 1 and n plus 1 will get cancelled. Plus, what is the derivative of a constant? So, on differentiating this x power n plus 1 by n plus 1, what is the report? x power n, we got this function back. You would have got it, but you need to add that constancy because we don't know the limits. Meaning, if I, if I differentiate this function also, I'm getting x power n. If I differentiate x power n by n plus 1 plus 1, I get the same answer. Plus 2, I get the same answer. So, unless you don't know what is the variable that is getting added, you should not leave that constant. You leave that constant only in the case of definite integrals because you know the limits between which you are integrated. Whereas here you don't know the limits, it can be any function. So, that is the reason why we add a constant, we don't multiply a constant. Right? So, this is the reason which for which a constant is added only in which condition? When you do the indefinite integration. Whenever you do definite integration, you will not add the constant. That I will tell you how to do Am I clear with this idea? Right. Yes. Now, listen to this carefully. Now, listen to this carefully. I give you the function and its integral value. So, integral of x power n dx is going to give us x power n plus 1 by n plus 1 plus c. So, integral of, if I have sin x, integral of sin x is minus cos x plus c. If I have cos x, I get sin x plus c. So, you would understand this? So, it exactly be reverse, meaning you don't have a perfect derivation for anything else for the function that you have. If you differentiate, you can get back the question. For example, derivative of only cos x is minus sin x. To eliminate that minus, we have a minus. The way you get less sin x. Derivative of sin x is cos x. Right? So, this is how it works. Right? As of now, if you know these three, that is more than sufficient. As I told you, whatever is needed for physics has to be enriched. I'm not going beyond that. My dear students, so now let's see how to handle this definite integral. Okay. Okay, I'm going to tell you what is the significance of definite integration. For example, when I ask you a question, now, what is the significance of differentiation? What do you do? find the slope of a slope of a tangent to occur at a given point? Similarly, there is a meaning of this definite integration as well. I'll tell you what it means. Suppose I take a function to be like this, some random function. So I take this is the this is y is equal to f of x. Let me take a limit here as a and let me take the limit here as b. These limits corresponding to the x for Okay. I'll take this as a comma 0 and let this be b comma 0 so that you will understand it better. But here is now if I drop a perpendicular from here. And let me call it as some x. 
Okay, let me call it as some text. Now, I will take another point which is very, very, very close to this point, which is very close to this point, so that I take that point to be x plus h, comma, 0. Okay, to be more specific, I will take it as x plus dx, comma, 0. x plus dx, comma, 0, where dx is this distance. Which is a very, very, very small value. Okay. Now, if I take this box, then what shape does this box take? It looks like a trapeze, right? But it can be approximated to a rectangle because these two points are very, very close to each other. So that this height and this height are the same. I mean, clear with this. So, this curvature is ignored because of the distance between these two verticals. So, if this is x, what would be the corresponding point here? So, what would be the corresponding point here? Is it not going to be x, comma f of x? You take this x and substitute it here. It is going to be x, comma f of x. Right. So, how much is this height? It is going to be f of x. Now, if I ask you, what is the area of shaded rectangle? What is going to be the area of the shaded rectangle? What is the area of shaded rectangle? X comma f of x. So, it is basically this thickness. So, how much is this thickness? This point is x comma 0. This point is x plus dx comma 0. So, what is the difference between these two points? So, this difference is going to be dx. It is only that much different. dx is a very, very, very small quantity. Right? So, area of the shaded rectangle is equal to f of x into dx. Can I write it like that? f of x into dx. Right? Now, how many such rectangles of this small quantity can I find between the points A and B? So how many can I find? Balaji, are you there? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, one just one small request. I I can't uh, see what you're pointing towards, sir, when you're showing it at the board because it doesn't appear on screen. I have switched on my video. No? Ah, now yes. It's... Yeah, yeah, so now it's visible. See, listen. So now is it clear f of x and dx? Like this, how many such thinnest rectangles you can find between a and b? You're going to have infinite such, right? So listen to this carefully. In your lower grades, you would have learned something like this. You will use sigma. You will use sigma when the data is discrete. Why do you use the sigma? In statistics. So in statistics, how is the data taken? Like for example, x1, x2, x3, all the data are discrete data. Right? So you use sigma xi where i is varying from 1 to n right like this. So what is the meaning of this? will have x1 plus x2 plus so on till xn. So what is that you are able to observe from this? Sigma i is equal to 1. What is this basically? This is the lower level. And i is equal to n is the upper level. Right? i is equal to 1 to n x of i where x is the variable. Where x is the variable. This is equal to sum of all these values. Am I clear with this? Now what you are going to do is you will use a sigma when you have discrete data in your hand. Whereas here you have continuous data, meaning you have infinite such rectangles which are attached to each other. So whenever you have continuous values, then to find the area made by curve, so area made by curve with 
x axis, you write it like this. The sigma is replaced with the symbol of integration because you are adding integral of this area. Okay. Like integral of all these small areas between these two points. Between the points, we do. So, when you do definite integration, what is it we are actually obtaining? We are actually obtaining the area made by the curve with the x axis. So, to be more specific, it is not always necessary that the area is calculated only with the x axis. To be more specific, I would say area made by the curve with the independent axis. So, how to find that independent axis? Is look at the variable that is there within there and look at the variable with respect to which you are integrating. So, if you do a to b integral of f of x dx, and this is what is going to be called as definite curvature. Am I clear with this point? Am I clear with this point? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, I didn't understand the part where you related sigma or, or you change sigma to that integral symbol, sir. See, sigma is used when you have discrete values. Okay. Integration is used when you have continuous symbols. Okay, sir. So, the day how we use this definite integrals, I'm assuming you already know it. Right? So, how to solve this? See, for example, integral of x square dx square between the values, let's say 1, 2, 3. Right? First, what you need to do is first integrate the function. Integral of x square is x cube, by x cube divided by 3. Then put a bracket like this. Right? Where you put the lower limit on the right bottom and the upper limit at the right top. Okay, 3. Then what you do is wherever the variable is there, substitute the upper limit. So what will you get? You will get 
V cube divided by V. Then subtracted from the value that you get by substituting the lower limit next. That is 1 cube divided by So answer is going to be 3 square minus 1 by 3. So 9 minus 1 by 3, which is 26 divided by 3. The meaning of this 26 divided by 3 is this curve x square is there. The meaning of it is this curve x square. What shape does an x square take? It takes the shape of a parabola. So the parabola, when you integrate it between the values 1 to 3, you get an area, right, that the parabola is making an x-axis. The value of this area is 26 by 3 square units. Meaning, when you do definite integration, you get a number. That number represents the area made by the curve with the independent axis. Whereas, when you do indefinite integration, you will not get a number, rather you will get some other function. For example, when you integrate x square, you get x cube by 3 plus c, that's it. That is when you do without the limits. But when you do it with the limit, you get a number. So now you, I hope you understood what is the meaning of that number. So 26 by 3 square units is going to be the max. 20 units, I make a note of this. Balaji, were you hear? Were you able to hear what I told? Yeah, yeah, so I heard. So just two more problems and then we can go to the next part. That is like this. Right. Find the integral of x power 5 dx between 1 to 3. Find the integral of sine x dx between 0 to 3. As of now, I am writing the 90 degrees, but let's write it in terms of 90 degrees. Find it. Did you learn about radius? Ah, Sir, can you repeat what you just said? Did you learn about? Radiance. Radiance. Yes, yeah. sir. Can I write it as 5 by 2 
Sixty-three by six. It is going to be x power six divided by six between the points one to two. So two power six is going to be sixty-four by six minus one divided by six. You are going to get sixty-three by six square root. So integral of sine x is going to be minus cos x between zero to pi by two. Right. So this is going to be minus cos of pi by two. Plus cos of zero. Why did I take a plus here? Because minus of minus. So cos pi by two is going to be a zero, and cos zero is one. Right. So integral of cos x is going to be sin x between zero to pi by two, and so it is going to be the upper limit that is sin pi by two minus sin zero. So sine pi by two is one minus sine zero is zero. So the answer will be one. So all these things are the values. Sir, but one of those is not as of now. As of now, not needed. I told you, I am teaching only whatever is needed for the things. Okay. Log exponential is needed. As of now, not needed. Okay. Can I clear with this? Right. Yes, Should, sir. Shall we proceed with the next part? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the next part that we are going to see is the next mathematical part is vector algebra. Right. It's called a Vector the GP. Meaning, we are going to learn about what are vectors and try to understand what are the different kinds of mathematical operations we can perform with them. Right. So, basically, before you understand this vector algebra, right? See, vector algebra actually falls under the mathematical part, right? And which is also important for the physics. Where we use the concept of vectors is for something called as physical quantities. So, what do you mean by physical quantities? So, what do you mean by physical quantities? The measurable quantities, as the name says, no quantity is something that can be measured. Physical refers to physics quantities. So, if you are able to refer to those values or Refer to those quantities, they can be majorly classified into two segments. Yeah. You can either call them as a scalar or something called as vector. Okay. So, here, first we need to understand certain terms before we get into the mathematical formation. For that, the first thing that I am going to define is a scalar quantity. So, what do you mean by a scalar quantity? Any physical quantity, any physical quantity that has magnitude, but not direction, direction is said to be a scalar quantity. A physical quantity that has magnitude but no direction is said to be a scalar quantity. So, what are going to be the examples of this? Examples of this are distance, speed, displacement is a vector part, time, mass, temperature. Right. All these are examples of scalar physical part.
Now the next question is about its counterpart. It is called as a vector quantity. So let's understand what are vectors. So what are vectors basically? They are also physical quantities which have both magnitude and direction. Right. So if you write it only table here, we are only half an An important point that needs to be added to this. They should obey the vector loss of addition. So, if a physical quantity has only magnitude and direction, you cannot call it a ring. One best example for it is electric current. Electric current has magnitude, it has direction, it always goes from higher to lower potential. But if you ask, is it a scalar or a vector quantity, it is not a vector quantity. It's scalar because it does not obey the vector loss of addition. Similarly, when you take time, Time has magnitude and direction. It is always forward direction. Time cannot be calculated in the reverse. It is not a vector. So they should follow vector laws of condition. Am I clear with this? So the example for this is displacement velocity acceleration Momentum. So when I say momentum, both linear and angular get covered in it. Then you talk about force, then you talk about torque. So these are all the examples of vector quantities. Are you here with this? Yes, sir. Sir, but generally in schools they don't they don't say that they must obey the vector loss of addition. Why, why they don't say that? Sir? Not about school. It's about the concept. Understand it. This this is important. Okay. If at all they have forgotten, make a note of this. Okay, okay sir. Not mentioned. Now you know it. Okay. No concept. Am I clear with this? Now, our complete focus is going to be only on vectors. First is, I need to know how is a vector represented. Space is over. What it is? Did, did a message come there? Discard or keep? Got deleted. Anyways, so now I hope you understood right what I'm speaking about. Did you? Yes, sir. Is the cursor there? No, it's not there. Okay, okay, it's there. Where is it? Uh, above, above the learning group. Okay, now it is me like. Right. Now we we'll see how to represent the vector. So the next question is going to be about representation of vectors. So what do I mean by representation of vectors is how are you diagrammatically sure that this physical quantity is a vector? How do you think? 
Basically, it's called as a directed line segment. Why I call it as a directed line segment and not as a ray? Because what is the ray? Ray is some ray is a one dimensional cube which has a starting point but no ending point. If that is the case, you cannot measure the length of it. If you ask what is the length of a ray, answer is infinite. So it does not have ending point. Why am I supposed to know the length of it? But a line segment has a definite, definite length. To that length, so that definite length is what is called as magnetic. Okay. To the definite length, if I am able to assign the direction, then I call that kind of a line segment as a directed line segment. So how it works is, it will be something like this. Right? With an arrow mark here, where this is called as the initial point and what is this called as obviously the final point any idea about what is going to be the technical name for it in terms of head and tail you have heard this head and tail no check that one. sir is it a ray check check that go in motion and a plane you will have it so take uh -huh. Uh -huh.
what is the area under velocity time constant? You would have learned it in your ninth grade also. Area under velocity time constant. Sir, I, I didn't hear, hear what you said, sir. Can you repeat? I asked, what is the area under the velocity time? Yeah. V is equal to U plus AT. Uh -huh. No, no, no. I'm asking what, the area, what does the area give you mathematically? What you told is right. Correct. What about the area under an acceleration time graph? That was the same main question. Sir, Delta 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 Oh, head and tail. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay, what is the initial point called as? Tail. You call this initial point as tail and you call this final point as tail. Okay. So the directed line segment is what is called the representation of a vector. That is one thing. And to give a name to this, you take a variable and put an arrow mark on top of it. So you take a variable and generally the variables are considered to be in the lower case. If you consider a single variable, it is going to be in the lower case. Whereas if you take this to the AB for instance, AB, sorry, A vector is the same as AB with an arrow mark on top of it. I think you are able to understand the difference. So when you give a single name to the vector, you write it in the lower case with an arrow mark on top. Whereas when you write it in the line segment form, you write it in the caps and then put an arrow mark on top. But right here it is right. So in this scenario, how do you read it as? It is read as a vector. It's not read as a vector. Read as a vector. Or we call it as AB vector. So this is how you represent it. Now the next question is how do I explain someone that this is the magnitude of a vector? How are you going to represent it? For that, what you do is you write a vector and put modulus around this. So this is called as Magnitude of a vector. So, magnitude of a vector is basically it is called as the length of the vector. So, it's called as the length of the vector. Right here, this right now. We go one way, make a note of this. So, this is how you represent it. Same syllabus, whatever I'm teaching, right? The basis. Same thing will happen. At least main spot, you can invest in. But one definitely, I have made a factor, main factors. If you prepare systematically, right? Means will be very good. 
So you see the paper in the TV like very basic with an equity work thing now right. So the nine chapter that was a major simply get four marks. Hmm. One question is four marks. Negative the minus one. A, if you put a bar on top of it, it's a vector. If you write a vector and a modulus around it, it's just a number. It's a length of that vector. So, what is the a vector? And then you okay, first make a number. Of this. Am I clear to this point? Shall I proceed? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the next question that we need to ask is something called as unit vector. So unit is the word derived from unity. Meaning any vector with magnitude one is called unit vector. Okay. So the representation of unit vector is you use the variable observe this. You will not put an arrow mark on top of it. You will put a symbol like this which is read as cap or hat. So how do you read it as? You read it as a cap or you read it as a hat. Right here with this. Right. So I hope that yeah, I hope the slide is clear. Right. Now I'm going to connect all the dots and tell you what exactly or how exactly you're supposed to write the vector with the combination of all these three values. Right. See, suppose I have a vector like this, which is A with a bar on top of it, right? If I take this to be a vector, right? Now, what is a vector basically? Vector is a combination of, vector is a combination of magnitude and direction. So vector is a combination of magnitude and direction. So a vector is equal to magnitude of this vector times a cap. So a vector is equal to magnitude of a vector times a cap, where this unit vector is used to represent direction. So unit vectors are always used to represent direction. So from here, you get a formula also. When I look at A cap, right? A cap is basically A vector divided by magnitude of A vector. Are you able to understand this? This is a very, very, very important thing. So how do you write a vector? Vector is basically magnitude times a unit vector. Unit vector is used to represent the direction of that particular vector. Now, I am going to discuss another type of unit vectors. Absolutely. Which are called as orthogonal unit vectors. So orthogonal means perpendicular. Unit vectors are the vectors of magnitude one, which are used to represent the direction. Okay. So if I take this to be the x-axis. This to be the y axis and this to be the z axis. 
right? Then anything which is moving along x direction is given a unit vector called as i with the cap on top of it. So you read it as i cap. So anything moving in the y direction is given j cap. Anything moving in the z direction is given as k cap. Okay. Now, suppose, listen to this. If I take this to be the origin, 0, 0, 0. Let me say there is a point here, pi, 0, 0. And there is a person who has moved from the point O to A. Right? Let me call that as A, for instance. Then, in this scenario, I will write A vector as what is the magnitude covered by the person when he has moved from O to A? Y. And what is the direction in which they have moved? It is I cap. I cap. So, A vector is written as 5 times I cap. Similarly, let's say there is a point in the uh, space such that it is pi comma 2 comma 0. So, this is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate, this is the z coordinate. Okay, means it is in the x, y plane. Suppose I take this point to be B and let me call this as OB vector. Right? See, OB vector, I take it as B for instance. Then, B vector is given as five units in the direction of x and and means plus two units in the direction of y plus zero times k cap. So basically here it is pi i cap plus zero j cap plus zero k cap. Similarly here it is zero k cap. Basically they don't write that zero. So I take the point to be here which is pi comma minus two comma zero. Then let me call this as C. C vector will be equal to pi by cap plus two times minus j cap. It is not minus two j cap. It is actually two times minus j cap because this first part is there, right? It is magnitude. Magnitude is always possible because it's a length. This yeah. plus or minus will depend the direction. Meaning, if I write minus j cap, then I'm trying to tell the person that the object is moving in the negative y direction. Plus, yeah. I don't right? Suppose I take a point like this, 2 comma b comma minus 4. What is the meaning of this? If I take this to be B, then what is B vector? 2i cap plus 3j cap minus 2 Write as plus 4 into minus 3. All of same. Are we clear with this? So make a note of this. Yes. Is, 
Now, I am going to tell you another important point, which is finding the magnitude of a vector. So, how to find the magnitude of a vector? First, I will explain the two dimension, then I will explain this to three dimensional space. If I take x comma y, if this point is comma three, for instance. So from here, if I drop a perpendicular, then this distance is going to be two, and this distance is going to be three. Right? This is going to be three. From here to here, if I join it, then if I take this to be OA, then how is OA vector written as? OA vector is written as two i cap plus three j cap. So what is going to be the length of OA? Square root of two square plus three square. Right. So here if I take the magnitude of OA vector, it is going to be square root of two square plus three square. So basically, what is this two square and three square? It is basically square root of coefficient of i cap square plus coefficient of j cap square. As of now, please know this one. So look for this one. This is not the reason. Means I'm trying to go back. I am trying to combine the coordinate geometry with the vector spot. So, what is coordinate geometry tell us? The length is going to be two square plus three square. What is the vector part telling us? It is going to be square root of coefficient of i cap square plus coefficient of j cap square. Right. So, if at all I have a vector like this, a vector is equal to a one i cap plus b one j cap plus c one k cap, then magnitude of a vector is given as root of a1 square plus b1 square plus c1 square. Basically, it is the sum of the squares of the coefficients of i cap, j cap, and k. Okay, this is another important point to be. Here with this, I hope you already know all these points. But you know the reason why you write it like this? Are you honest? Yes, sir. Connecting the coordinate geometry to the vector part. Last concept, which is very small, I'll explain. Unit vector in the direction of in the direction of given vector. Meaning, let's say they give you something like this: a vector is equal to two i cap plus three j cap plus four k cap. Find a cap in the direction of find a cap in the direction of a vector. And suppose the question is like this. Then what you need to do is you write a cap is equal to a vector divided by the magnitude of a vector. So what is a vector? It is 2i cap plus 3j cap plus 4k cap 4 divided by square root of 2 square plus 3 square plus 4 square. So answer will be 2i cap plus 3j cap plus 4k cap 4 divided by 2 square is 4, 4 plus 9 is 13, 13 plus 16 is 29. So this is going to be the unit vector in the direction of a vector. 
How many of you ever did this? AB vector, AB vector is 2i k plus 3j k plus 4k. That doesn't make sense. These are very, very, very basics. Right? Then I have to think of the different types of vectors. And then the operations like triangle law of addition, parallelogram law of addition, then what product is first? I think we'll be able to complete the next steps. Maybe one dot class is okay. Then we'll do some problems with it. If you do problem based on this channel, the total of the problem. Scalar and dot. We just use scalar dot and dot. We didn't do the. Those things. See, one more thing is, uh, like, what I do since we have like two days of this. Uh, I want you guys to learn this. For the, I already have worked on some pre recorded videos. Aladia, my audible. Sir, no, no, sir, your voice is low, little bit low. Okay. So, what I'm saying is, I have worked on some pre recorded content where, for example, this theory and perfect actually we are basically typing. We already know it. So, instead, what you can do is, I'll tell you, like, I'll give you a weekly target. You can work on the pre recorded videos. You have to make the notes and upload it to the app. I will work on problems. Okay, see, the biggest challenge which happens with 11 standards, as you can ask your senior, they will say they don't know how to touch problems. Everybody knows theory. Everybody knows derivation. They are direct derivation, they are right. But 11 is not right. It is all about the problems, especially when it comes to the assertion reason and when it comes to the case study basis, they are not able to touch it. When they come to 12, they are struggling. I don't want your batch to become better. So, for that, we need to start working in this one. I'll give it in such a way that if you spend half an hour time, half an hour to 45 minutes of time, you'll be able to prepare this. For example, whatever I taught today, right, in winter, if you actually take the correct time and see, right, it will not be more than 20 to 30 minutes. But in between, I gave you time to write and all those things. That is why it will appear as a You're able to understand? So, this part, I want your cooperation where you work on the pre recorded content and come to the class. But I'll be very strict on that if you're checking your notes. Because without preparing, you come and sit in the class. If I do problem, you'll get demotivated. I don't want that also. So, dear everyone, right? So, from next week, what I do is say, I don't want this one week to go this. I already have the pre recorded content for the lecture stuff. I'll be giving it to you. Everybody has downloaded the app, right? You can go through them, make the notes so that next week I'll solve more problems. When I solve problems, if at all you have, I'm not saying I'm not going to teach the class at all. If at all you didn't understand any concept, you are most, more than welcome to ask. You say, sir, I went through the cross product concept, I didn't understand. Can you explain me once I do it? But the only question that I'd ask is, which part you didn't understand? 
Is it about you didn't understand the formula at all, or is it like something you didn't understand with respect to directions? Which part was not clear is what I'm going to ask for that. You will know the answer only when you work and you need to do that work. I think I'm asking a reasonable thing. Right? I'm not asking you to sit and study and come. It's the same lecture. Right? It could be like how I'm teaching a one. Just go through it. Okay. So that my target is to generally if I teach everything and complete the syllabus, second volume I have to rush like I will not get time to solve problems at all. Due to which we'll be able to complete the syllabus only in month of the Third bit, they'll again tell you them, they'll be in a hurry to start your uh, standard. School will not be bothered about your level because it's not good. School is only bothered about the standard. I'm not talking about your school teaching. Okay, but for me, this both are important. Because tomorrow you're writing any competitive exam, I don't want you to struggle. Your confidence level should be good. Am I clear with this? So this I'll be working along with them. You also got so next week, this week onward, we'll start. And secondly, next week alone, I have some travel plans because I have some rituals. So I'll be in Hyderabad, but I'll be taking class online. Am I clear? So next week is holiday, right? For you holidays, right? So what I'll do is I'll shift it to morning. Instead of evening this time, I'll shift it to morning somewhere around the 9.30 to 11, you will have class. Okay, I'll inform you in well in advance. That week alone, again from me, first week, I'll be back. Am I clear? So no doubts now. Right. Work along the line. Let's stand it portion, sir. Then. Pastor? Students want to come here. Let me tell them. I mean, level. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Ah, uh, should I leave now and join the math class? Sir? Leave, 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 leave. Okay, sir. The peanut your number. Okay, This is a strange Yeah, I'm going to Why? Oh, oh. Start button enabled like that. 